So this talk has two parts to it. In the first part, we're going to look at compiling some common machine learning systems into symbolic representations that have the same input-output behavior. And we're going to see that once we have that input-output behavior captured symbolically, then we can reason about these boxes. Uh, for example, to explain their behavior, uh, understand their robustness, and so on. Again, by reasoning symbolically. In the second part of the talk, we're going to do something a little bit more ambitious, where we're going to look into designing machine learning systems that facilitate reasoning about the behavior. And there we're going to see a proposal that can be understood as uh, compiling the structure of neural networks from causal models. So let's start with the first part, which is going to be focused on this particular picture that uh, kind of show what's mostly happening in AI today as far as real-world applications and impact. So what we have here is a labeled data set, and then we go ahead and learn a machine learning box. It could take different forms, a Bayesian network classifier, neural network, a random forest, but it's a box that effectively implements a decision function that takes instances and then renders decisions based on these instances. Now, what we'd like to do is reason about the behavior of this numeric box, as mentioned earlier. The fundamental observation that underlies our work on the subject is that even though uh, these boxes have been learned from data, and even though they're numeric, they often do implement uh, discrete decision functions. So what we'd like to do is capture those discrete functions symbolically, as uh, we will see uh, next, and the reason about them also symbolically. So here's uh, an example machine learning box, one of the simplest you can have around. It's known as a naive base classifier. I have three features and a class variable. Uh, you give me values for these features, test results, then we compute the procedure on the class variable pregnancy, and then I check the procedure against the threshold and render the decision. The numbers here uh, all could have been learned from data. As I mentioned earlier, even though this is a numeric box, it does implement a discrete function in the following sense. The input to the box are the values of three, these discrete variables, u, v, and s, and the output is a discrete decision, yes and no. Uh, what I'll focus on initially is capturing this discrete decision function uh, using uh, decision graphs. And then we're going to generalize this later. So a decision graph uh, uh, is a generalization of a decision tree. I guess people know what decision trees are. If you allow parents to ha or nodes to have multiple parents, then uh, we get decision graphs. And decision graphs could be exponentially smaller than decision trees in general. Now, these are not just decision graphs. They're ordered decision graphs, meaning that the features are tested in the same order across any path from the root to a leaf. And that makes these graphs tractable in the sense that a number of operations that are hard in general on decision graphs become now polynomial and typically linear. And we're going to see examples of that uh, later. Uh, it's important, again, to note that the machine learning system here and the symbolic decision graph, they both make the exact same decisions on uh, instances, and this is actually guaranteed by the compilation algorithm uh, that uh, basically guarantees this uh, precise match between inputs and outputs. Now, interestingly enough, uh, this particular algorithm for compiling uh, naive base classifiers, the restricted case of naive base classifiers to order decision diagrams is quite old, about 15 years old, uh, and we recently generalized this to three structures, and just this year we generalized this to arbitrary Bayesian network structures. Now, uh, the meat behind the algorithm is uh, uh, the notion of depth first search over features, which is very common and similar to what you would do in, uh, let's say, DPLL in the context of sets overs. But the other major component is this notion of equivalent subclassifiers. Uh, you get a subclassifier when you fix some of the features to a particular value. So you get a subclassifier over the remaining features. And sometimes it doesn't matter how you fix the first set of features. You still get the same classifier over the remaining one. The algorithm actually identifies such subclassifiers and exploits them in various ways. I, I do encourage you to look at the details of the algorithm because there's some sophisticated observations there. Uh, underlying how it works. Now, we did apply uh, this algorithm to a variety of networks in the or classifiers uh, in the uh, literature. Uh, here's an example from uh, educational testing. Here's another example from uh, diagnosis. Here's yet another example from diagnosis, but in this case, medical diagnosis. This actually tries to diagnose breast cancer. 
And the one thing that we found is that the sizes of the obtained decision graphs can vary substantially, even for networks that look like they're of a similar size. Uh, for this particular one, actually, the size of the decision graph was pretty small. It was only 156 nodes ordered decision diagram. And you're seeing all of it on this particular slide without the node labels. And here's some more data that uh, gives you a sense of how the size of the decision uh, graphs can vary from a couple of hundred nodes all the way to millions. Now, it's very important to stress a particular point here. When people say that decision trees or graphs are desirable as machine learning boxes, they're typically referring to their interpretability, that by visual inspection that you can get a sense of what they're doing. Now, this is not our interest in these uh, representations here because we will operate algorithmically on decision graphs to uh, do all kind of things like explanations uh, that's coming next. So for us, it doesn't matter whether it is actually a couple of hundred nodes or three millions. In a sense, as long as you can store this decision graph, uh, you can do all kind of interesting things on it efficiently as uh, we see later. So what can you do with these uh, symbolic representations of the machine learning boxes once you obtain them? And, and let me again stress tractable representation. The first thing that we did is explanation. So in an explanation, what happens is you have a box, you feed it an instance, it comes up with a decision, and you ask the question, why did you make that decision? So here we propose a couple of types of explanations. The simplest, maybe, and more general, it's called the PI explanation. And what it does is identify a subset of your instance uh, features that if you fix, the decision will stick regardless of what the remaining features are. And uh, there is a similar uh, explanation called MC explanations, but more appropriate for something called monotonic classifiers. We will mention those uh, later. Now, let's look at some concrete examples. Uh, here we have the symbolic classifier that we uh, compiled from an IU phase one. And uh, we have a patient, Susan. She tested positive for scanning blood and urine. And the classifier says that. Uh, Susan is pregnant. And then you say, why did you conclude that Susan is pregnant? And the answer comes back because the scanning test came out positive. So basically what you're getting back here is it didn't matter that the blood and urine tests were positive. It could have been anything else and I would still have made the same decision. Uh, here's another explanation or another example which is a little more interesting. If Sally tested negative for these three tests and the classifier says that Sally is not pregnant. And then you say, why did you conclude that Sally is not pregnant? And the answer comes back, because the scanning test was negative and one of the blood or urine test came out negative. So in this case, you're being told that it was not necessary for the blood and urine to be both negative. It's sufficient for one of them to be negative and I would have still made the same decision. So in a sense, what you're getting back is the most general property of the instance that have caused the box to make that decision on the instance. And interestingly enough, uh, uh, at least for the MC explanations, they can be computed in, in linear time. What I'm going to do in the next few slides is just like sweep through a number of animations just to give you a sense of the algorithm, just to stress the fact that it amounts to a few passes, linear passes, over the decision graph. Uh, the first step in actually doing an explanation is converting the decision graph into a circuit structure, which is a standard transformation. And uh, in this particular case, we're trying to explain the instance, uh, positive instance, U will not be an S. So if uh, this was classified as pregnant, and I want to see, do I really need both U and S to have made that decision? The uh, process is pretty simple. You basically do a whole bunch of operations. One of them is called conditioning, where you fix the value of negative features. And the second one is called uh, minimum cardinality, where you do a simple upward pass computing these minimum cardinality numbers. And then you go ahead and prune the circuit through a minimization process. And then a third operation called uh, enumeration. And finally, you get your explanation. So what you're getting back here is the unit test did not have to be positive. It could have been negative, and I was still made the same decision. And then you see that these. Uh, operations that I just showed you, and this approach actually is quite old. It comes from the world of model-based diagnosis being relevant again here for reasoning about the behavior of AI systems once we're able to capture their uh, behavior symbolically. So explanation is just one thing you can do. You can do more things. So uh, verification. One example is checking whether a classifier is monotonic or not. So what is a monotonic classifier? Uh, technically, it means that if you have a positive instance, 
uh, it remains positive if you flip some of the features from negative to positive. For example, let's look at this example. Here we have four features and, and the instance says positive, negative, negative, positive. So I classify this as positive. The middle features, the second and third are negative. If I turn these into positive, then the decision sticks. Let's, let's look more concretely. So in educational testing, an example of monotonicity is if Susan's correct answers include Jack's correct answers, then Susan should pass if Jack passed, right? Interestingly enough, you build classifiers to check competence and you don't even know if they satisfy this property. And this is a hard property to satisfy. For example, it is known to be hard on, on uh, Bayesian network classifiers. This is another example from credit scoring. If Susan and Jack have the same characteristics, except that Susan has a higher income, then Susan should be approved for a loan if Jack is approved. Again, you learn a classifier from data. You don't even know that it has this property and, and you want to verify that it has this property. And it turns out that if you have an ordered decision diagram, uh, monotonicity can be checked in quadratic time very efficiently. And we did apply this technique for a variety of uh, classifiers out there. And interestingly enough, we found some odd things in, in some cases. Uh, you know, in this uh, classifier, uh, it's, it's not you need a medical expert, but the point is uh, there's almost no way you can do this on the raw uh, classifier. You basically, once you have the symbolic version, uh, you can uh, do all kind of things. And uh, let me mention that even though we started by compiling Bayesian network classifiers and into decision diagrams, uh, we've recently expanded the scope in a number of dimensions. First. As far as queries, it's not just explanation, but we've been looking at robustness, and I'll show you an example of that, and, and verification, I'll just give you an example of monotonicity. Uh, we started with Bayesian network classifiers, but we recently expanded into neural networks, binarized ones, and random forests, and even though I showed you an example of compiling into an order decision diagram, uh, more generally, we compile into what we call tractable Boolean circuits. So the OBDD or the uh, order decision diagram is just one example, but there are other examples like sentential decision diagrams, the DNFs that I've been working on for a while. And again, the general theme of this work is uh, once you get the input-output behavior captured in a tractable circuit, you're effectively in heaven. You have all kinds of techniques from classical AI and computer science that can be applied to do all kinds of things that people want to do about these systems. Uh, on the side, uh, there is an example of a neural network for telling zero versus one digits that we compiled. It has around 98.74% accuracy, and you can see that for the image at the top, classifies it as zero, and you say why, and in this case, our PI explanations come back with three pixels that if you fix to Y, this neural network will always classify the input as a zero, regardless of what you do. All right, this is one of the insights that you get from, uh, from these things. Uh, as you know, binarized neural networks you know, gathering some attention for other reasons, efficiency and space, but we do like this work because it's something that makes it easy for us to compile and reason about. Uh, I will uh, skip the slide on tractable circuits, which is the really underlying technology that we use to compile these things into, except to say that I recently gave a tutorial on this subject. And in fact, the organizer just reminded me that I have to send them my slides to post. So um, hopefully within a few days, you can find the slides on this subject online uh, at the summer school in case you want to look into uh, these kind of tools. Let me mention two more things before I go to the second uh, part of the talk. So uh, beyond explanation and verification, robustness. So robustness in this case, we define it as the smallest uh, basically number of inputs you have to flip so that your decision changes. And it was interesting to see that certain systems that are somewhat equivalent in terms of performance, they can really vary big in terms of robustness. So what you see on this uh, slide here is two neural network CNNs, convolutional ones for digit recognition, almost have the same accuracy, but looked very different from robustness. The histograms you're seeing, uh, basically it's a bit faded. Uh, the blue one, uh, the peak is at around robustness of I think 13. So it tells you most of the instances that you pass to your classifier has about robustness of 13. It takes at least 13 flips of the input or pixels in this case for the decision to switch, while the red one is around I believe five is the peak. So again, two 
classifiers that have a, almost the same uh, performance, but very different uh, robustness. And by the way, I don't know if you realize the two to the two to the 56. So this is 16 by 16. Uh, how do you plot this diagram while actually uh, looking at that many instances? Impossible, except that we have a tractable representation of this neural network as a tractable circuit. So we can actually plot these uh, graphs efficiently. And this is one of the benefits of capturing the input output behavior as a tractable uh, circuit. I think the takeaway from this part of the talk is uh, there is a now kind of a new role for symbolic AI in a sense where you reason about what you learned. Okay, you may not want to use these techniques to build the system itself, but if you build it using machine learning techniques, you can abstract its behavior into a symbolic representation and uh, uh, basically let the wealth of AI techniques that have been developed over the decades to reason about its behavior. Uh, in terms of similar spirit, there is the VNN Verifying Neural Networks community, which does similar things, except not necessarily compiling into uh, circuits that precisely capture the input output behavior, but abstracting the behavior and then uh, uh, basically running various queries on the representation. I have to say there are similar lines of work, but all about approximate uh, reasoning about the behavior, where you take the uh, ML system and somewhat sample it or imitate its behavior and then reason about that. This is different. What we're doing here is all exact. I'm gonna leave out how we compile tractable, uh, uh, how we compile neural networks and tractable circuit and just mention one more slide before I go to the next part about uh, random forest, which is uh, another popular class of machine learning systems. In a sense, these are the friendliest among the three that I've mentioned, neural networks and Bayesian network classifiers, because they're almost symbolic. Even when they have continuous variables, the learning algorithm itself finds the threshold. So A greater than three and B less than 7.3, that's already a Boolean event. So converting these things into Boolean circuits is relatively easy. The hard part is compiling these circuits into tractable ones so you can reason about. And we had already some preliminary results unpublished in this case, and it's pretty impressive what you get in terms of insights into what these random forests are um, uh, doing. So this is as far as the first part. And again, just re re remember here's the, the main message is, is the reasoning about what was learned using symbolic techniques if you manage to abstract the behavior uh, sim sim symbolically. So now I'm gonna switch gears into a, a different uh, mode. So instead of saying, give me the system that you built, I'll abstract its behavior and then try to reason about it, we're gonna get into something a little bit more ambitious, which is uh, how do we build systems that are somewhat easier to reason about. And for that, I have to appeal to a distinction I made in this article that, that was mentioned in the introduction about the state of the eye, where, where I basically uh, talked about model-based versus function-based approaches to AI, or what people would call uh, 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 model-free approaches. And uh, the, the, the basic idea is, we traditionally, when we solve certain problems, we build models, we represent knowledge, we reason, but now uh, we found out that we can do a lot of that by simply uh, creating mappings or functions. So any problem, you can look at it, box it, and say, here's the input, here's the output. Instead of modeling the underlying phenomena, just give me enough labeled data, and I'll basically fit a function. And what we, and of course, neural network is the main tool for, for building these mappings. And what we found out is this works pretty well. So if you look at the AI headlines today, if these were headlines in the 80s or 90s, they would have meant something different than what they mean today. At that time, people were trying to compile uh, to, to, to model systems. So if you look at this and say, wow, we figured out deception and reading minds and smiles and this and that. No, we haven't figured much here. We basically found out that we can create effective mappings that address these particular problems. So good, the good news is we're finding out that we don't have to work as hard as far as solving certain problems, right? We don't have to model, we can basically, uh, as I said, uh, learn these uh, mappings and uh, that's the good news. But now, because of the way these mappings are constructed, people are complaining. So uh, they want to explain them, as we've seen. They want to verify the properties. They want to make them robust and, and less data hungry and so on. And then here's the dilemma. Uh, doing something really profound about all of these things point you back to building models. Uh, but if you want to get performance, as we're seeing today, you go to fitting uh, functions. So what are we going to do? How, how can we actually get the best of the two? 
And it gets a little bit more confusing uh, with the following uh, observation. So if you look at one of the main modeling languages that uh, basically dominated AI for almost two decades, probabilistic graphical models and Bayesian networks in particular, you realize that you can actually uh, play this game of function fitting at the, at the modeling level in the sense that if you give me a graphical model like this, anytime you define inputs, variables that you're observing, and anytime you're defining a variable that you want to compute the probability of, you have effectively defined a functions in, in the sense of, uh, you know, function fitting. And in fact, you can fit this function discriminatively by giving me labeled data. Uh, and I'll show you this, how this gets done in a very precise way. But this did not have as much impact as we're having with the neural uh, networks. So why is that the case? So here's what's going to happen in, the, in this next uh, 10 minutes or so. We're going to try to do something about this. And, and the, 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 the summary of the situation is going to be is this. Uh, we're going to spend a couple of slides looking at the main thing about neural networks and why they are effective. We're going to have a major insight there that we're going to point to and bookmark. And then we're going to come back to uh, these modeling tools, basically major networks, and see why fitting functions that are generated from models may not be as effective and where do you get in trouble. And what we're going to do is we're going to fix this by taking the insights from neural networks and injecting it into neural in, into Bayesian networks. And then the rest will be mostly results and implications. So stay tuned and, and see what's going to happen. There's actually a fundamental concept that's going to come out in what's going to happen next. And uh, the, the bottom line is going to be that if your model is correct, the, your, your graphical model is correct, you should do pretty well. But sometimes even simple mistakes in the graphical model can throw you completely off. And, and you'll see how we're going to fix this by borrowing an insight from neural networks. So let's start first by a major insight about uh, a, a neural network. So neural networks are not just function fitters. They are actually universal function approximators in the sense that uh, you give me any function from, let's say, x1 through xn to y, then you can approximate that to an arbitrary error. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is the following. In order to get this universal approximation result, you can't use any kind of activation function in the neurons. So for example, if your activation function is a linear function, then the whole neural network is a linear function, and you don't get universal approximation. Now, you get universal approximation if you use, let's say, sigmoids. OK, but now here's the interesting thing. If you use ReLUs, you get universal approximation. Now, look at what a ReLU is. The ReLU says, if you're below 0, just emit a 0. Otherwise, emit x as is. So it is actually two linear functions. So what happened here? How come I jumped now from linear to universal approximability, and the key which we're going to bookmark, because that's the concept we're going to use later, is the notion of testing. That is, I'm able to conduct a test based on the input. And depending on what that test is, I use this linear function or that linear function. Now, if you think about it, that shouldn't be surprising. Look at the most basic approximation technique from your calculus book. I can approximate any function to arbitrary error using constants, if you allow me to test. All right. So if you look at this figure, uh, by simply having enough of these regions, I can have an arbitrary uh, uh, approximation. So remember this. This is the main insight we're going to use by really including a minor epsilon change on how Bayesian networks work, and we're going to turn them into universal approximators, and, and you're going to see this. Okay, now let's switch to, uh, and let me just mention that neural networks with ReLUs, which are pretty popular these days, the functional form of these are simply piecewise linear functions because of this notion of testing. All right? So each piece looks like this. You have the inputs i1 through in, and here's your linear function, but you have a whole bunch of pieces that look like that. And, and that is already universal approximation. And the number of pieces called regions also depend on the size and depth of the neural network, and also that relates to its expressiveness. Now, let's go to uh, Bayesian networks and see why function fitting, when the function is structure is generated from a model, does not work as well. All right? So uh, there are going to be a couple of slides on this, and, and there's going to be a major insight about Bayesian networks that even for experts may sound uh, a bit uh, surprising. And then again, we'll, we'll just fix this as you will see. So here's a little Bayesian network, three variables, A, B, C. And I'm 
observing A and C, and I'm trying to compute the probability on B. So I already defined my function. The input is A and C, and the output is C. Not only I can fit this function discriminatively, we know from at least a couple of decades ago that I can generate a structure for this function in the form of an arithmetic circuit. I introduced these uh, around two decades ago, where the input to these circuits are your evidence, which is in this case A and C, and you have the other type of input are the parameters which come from the model. These are the ones that get fit by gradient descent. And then you've got your output. So basically, I generate the structure, the AC, which is more like a neural network, except that it's not arbitrary. It's generated from a model based on a specific query. And then you give me labeled data, and I can fit using gradient descent. All right? And in fact, this game can be very sophisticated in the sense that you can integrate domain knowledge and give you guarantees on the behavior of the box that you got in because every wire makes uh, some sense. But now we're going to see what can go wrong with this uh, in just a second. Let me just mention that uh, some of you will look at this and say, uh, what's the relation between ACs and SPNs? You can read this paper from two years ago. but. Uh, Basically, ACs uh, were a decade older than uh, SPNs, and this precise relation is in this paper. Now, please listen to this part, because <laughs> this is where even experts on, on graphical models uh, find this a little bit surprising. So here's the small model, and I have the input on A and C and the output on B. The question is, what is the functional form of this particular query that is embedded in the circuit. So we've seen with neural networks piecewise linear and universal approximation. In this case, it's very simple. It's a multilinear function. Each output here is just a multilinear function, and the, when you normalize the outputs to get a conditional probability, all you're doing is dividing two multilinear functions. So that's not only a limited form, but you'll see in a little bit one more restriction on it. The surprising part is, that if your model, uh, and, and let me just say that the, 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 the mu1 through mu8, in this case, the coefficients of, of this uh, form are functions of your parameters. I did not spell them out, otherwise it will get very hairy. The surprising part is this. If your model was this instead, you still have the exact same functional form that you're seeing there. The only difference is the coefficients mu1 through mu8 are constrained a little bit differently. If your model was like this, it will still be the same functional form. The only thing that's changed is the constraints on the coefficients. So what happens is when you use the different model than was intended, you are constraining this functional form and sometimes ruling out the data generating uh, function. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll see this in just a, a, a second. So. The, the key concept here is the notion of a constrained multilinear function, which is the functional form of these graphical model, and that the constraints on the coefficients of this form are dictated by the topology and location of the input-output variables. So let me show you in the next two slides when things go well, when you fit functions based on models, and when things go wrong, and then we'll, we'll get to the fix. Here's where things would go typically well. So I have, in this case, a model that was built to detect rectangles in images. It's a generative model. Uh, you can look at the height, the width, the location. You've got the last layer representing the pixels. Uh, you take something like this and you say, my input is the pixels in the image, I want to predict the height of the rectangle. You build an arithmetic circuit for this, you train it using radius density to grade. You get like more than 99%. You can do a neural network for this CNN, you get similar behavior. The one difference though is the uh, AC is a little bit more robust in this case. So with very little data, you can get almost about 99 plus performance. If you don't have enough training data, the neural networks start not doing as great, which is what you'd expect. The problem is I have a great model in this case that I've, I've built. Here's an example where even missing an edge can generate circuits that will have trouble fitting to data. So I'll show you just two more examples of trouble. Uh, that symbolize what we need to fix, and then we're going to be getting to how we're going to fix this. So this is a data set. You can find this on Wikipedia under the page called Simpson's Paradox. You have here is basically uh, two treatments for kidney stones, treatment A and B. And if you look at the data, uh, treatment A is better if the kidney stone is small. 
it's also better if the kidney stone is large, but if you look at the totality of the data, treatment P is better. Okay, so you have a phenomena that appears in every subgroup, but it reverses when you look at the whole subgroup. This is not paradoxical when you look at the causal model that generated this data. What's happening here is doctors prefer to use treatment B when the kidney stone is small. So when I tell you I did treatment B, the higher success rate is because that's indicative of a smaller kidney stone, all right? Now, if you miss that edge and, and you use this model and you build a, a circuit that tries to fit this data, the input is the treatment and the size of the stone and the output is the probability of success. Provably, provably, you cannot do that. Not only is this constraint functional form, uh, the constraints that this structure imposes on mu1 through mu8, not only does it rule out the data generating function, it would rule out any function that exhibits the Simpson paradox. So basically, you're, you're dead, and, and, and the proposition four in this paper that appeared in ICML shows that. You can't recover from this, right? That's, that's the point, you can't. And, and again, the problem is these are limited functional forms, multilinear functions, and they're constrained. Here's one more example where you have two causes and effect, but they have these latent variables that relate these causes. Uh, the data is generated under various settings of these latent variables, but you're not aware of them. So you try to fit only the blue nodes, and you can see on the one side what the data looks like on, on the right side if you try to fit completely uh, off. Folks, okay. Now we're gonna get to one more metaphor, and then we'll get to the solution and results. If you're gonna remember anything about this talk, it's gonna be this example that's coming up next. All right, so this example, will show you what the problem that we've been talking about in an abstract sense and will show you also the solution. I have a data set which happens to be shown on the screen and I tell you and I want to fit it using a function and I give you this function y equals ax plus b. This looks fantastic. The data itself is linear and the function that I'm going to be use, the functional form is linear. So you think it's great. Except that I'm going to go constrain that functional form by telling you the coefficient a can only be this and the coefficient b can only be inside this interval. Now the situation is very different. Realize this business of constraining a and b is an abstraction of the notion of using the wrong causal structure. Because once you miss edges or nodes, you impose constraints on your coefficients. Look what happens. Even though your data is linear, the constrained lines that I'm allowing you to use when fitting will not do a good job on your data set. So you're doomed. And that's what happens when you try to fit with modeling mistakes. Now look at the solution. And, and, and this is the part that you have to remember about this whole talk. And that's the insight we're gonna get, we got from neural networks. If you try to be piecewise, that is, Restrict yourself to the family that I gave you, but use different pieces depending on X. Look what happens. I'm using here nine pieces. Each one of the piece belongs to the constraint functional form, but I'm using a different piece. There's a different A and B depending on X. And now I can do pretty well. If you increase the number of pieces, look what happens. Even better. You increase the number of pieces, look at the visualization. I made a line that fits the data that does not belong to the constraint functional form by basically being piecewise linear. Now, neural networks with the are doing this, and now we're gonna see how we're gonna take that idea and put it in Bayesian networks so that they're not only multilinear, but piecewise multilinear, and that will make them f universal approximators, and you're gonna see how they'll be able to recover from the modeling errors next, all right? How are we gonna do this? It's pretty simple. If you know graphical models, you know beyond the causal structure, the main thing is this notion of a CPT or a conditional probability table. That is, for every node B, if it has, let's say, a parent A, I have to give you a distribution over B for every state of A. So in this case, A0, I give you distribution 0 0.7, 0 0.3. The only change we're gonna make to Bayesian networks is the following. Instead of one distribution, I want two. And I'm gonna choose one of them depending on the input, the evidence. And the test here is, I'm gonna compute probability over the state A0 given the evidence on its ancestors, and I'm gonna check that 
with this threshold. If the threshold passes, I'll use one distribution, otherwise another. And you'll see all of this gets learned by gradient descent. So what happens in this case? I get what we call testing Bayesian networks. And while a Bayesian network represents a single distribution, these guys represents a set of distributions. One of them gets chosen based on evidence. What happens practically? Practically, here's our previous example. I have evidence on A and C, and I'm actually computing a property on B. And this is the arithmetic circuit. But if you come and tell me I want to make B testing, that is, I want its distribution to be selected dynamically based on evidence, the compiled circuit is called a testing arithmetic circuit, and it looks like this. Unfortunately, the nodes that have all of these colored edges and them are not labeled correctly, but we call these testing units. They should be rectangles that are shaded. And those nodes are the ones that select the right parameter for B based on the evidence. So the circuit has two parts to it. One part is selecting the right parameters of the node B, and the other is doing the regular computation. And uh, you can think of these tags or testing arithmetic circuits as neural networks that are generated from models or causal models. Now, I'll tell you why I'm calling them neural networks in just a second. But you can integrate background knowledge into these. You can offer guarantees on their behavior. Every node here has a meaning. You can train them using gradient descent. Now, why am I calling these neural networks? Because these guys represent piecewise multilinear functions. Remember neural networks with 10 minutes total? Five. So uh, neural networks basically uh, with values represent uh, piecewise linear functions. These are piecewise multilinear functions, basically, and they're universal approximators. You can make them fit any functions to an arbitrary error. Typically, we don't use these threshold-based selections because they're not friendly for gradient descent. Think of them like step functions in neural networks, but we use sigmoid uh, selection units, which kind of mix these parameters. And in this case, uh, the TAC will actually represent an infinite number of distributions. So uh, in the last few minutes, let me just show. If Here's the Simpson paradox. Remember when we missed that edge and we tried to fit this data using an AC, we said provably you cannot capture that phenomena. If you make the node S testing, you actually get a perfect fit in this case. And you can see the details of this experiment in the ICML paper. If you look at visually, you can see the true model and, and how the data looks like, and you can see the AC versus the TAC fit. If you look at the example of the latent variables, where, uh, again, you can see what the function looked like, the data generating function, and fitting using ACs versus TACs, again, we recovered in this case. Uh, let's look at some more examples. In this case, uh, Bayesian network, two inputs, x, y, the output is z. And we're going to make up some functions and see what happens when you try to fit with the nodes t1, t2, and z being testing or not. And look what happens. These are the functions. Uh, you generate data from these, x, y, z, and, and you try to fit using arithmetic circuits. You can't. Uh, you make the nodes testing, and, and look what happens. All right, so uh, the bottom line here is, again, I'm able to recover by being piecewise, which is what's happening with neural networks. One more experiment. In this case, you have basically data generated from a high-ordered HMM, hidden Markov model. But then I'm going to pretend that I don't know that my data is coming from a high-order HMM. And I'm fitting using a regular HMM. And you're going to have trouble in general. But if you're using testing HMMs, uh, then this experiment shows that you actually do quite well in this case and, and, and still uh, fit. So there is more results on this, for example, that you know, the classical results about Bayesian networks that you can reason based on de separation and topology to give guarantees on behavior still hold. And the various considerations we're looking at at this particular point, I, I want to mention probably the most important of them is this notion of how evidence impacts selection. Because if you look carefully into the details of this, you realize you can't select based on all available evidence. Only a subset of it can be used for things to remain coherent. Um, and I think similar ideas can be used beyond uh, Bayesian networks. But the, the, the bigger vision here in the last couple of minutes is the following. 
currently you get a labeled data set and you go and basically put a bunch of layers for a neural network to fit. The idea is I want to be able to play that game in a more principled way. That if you have some knowledge about your domain, how can you use that to control the structure of the neural network? We know how to do this in an extreme way where I have a graphical model, I generate a function, but I showed you the problems. Unless your model is perfect, you're in trouble. So you've got the two extremes. I got the model perfect, then I can do this fantastically, or otherwise I'm completely model free. What we want to do is somewhere in between, where you have partial knowledge. The model is not perfect, it's missing some edges, but I'm still giving you something that sits in between a perfect model and completely model free. That's what we're trying to do here. So that, in a sense, as I said, generate neural network structures from knowledge that you have in the form of partial models. And uh, I've been very involved in this recently. In fact, the tool for this, I've been programming myself for the last few months. It's called PyTech. Hopefully, it will come out later this summer. It is modeled around what you see today for a neural network tools. But once more, the analog here is kids now, our undergraduates, they you know get across, get a label data set, slam a few layers of a neural network, fit the data, and they're happy. I wanted to be able to do the same thing, but instead of slamming a bunch of layers, build a causal graph, and put whatever knowledge they know about the relationship between some of the nodes. Some they may not know, and some may know. And then synthesize a tag, and basically train that discriminatively with the benefits that mentioned earlier that you can give guarantees on what function structure you generated, you can do with less data, da, da, da. So we'll see how this will work. And uh, I wish to finally, if you want to follow us, as they say, you can check our YouTube channel. Just type UCLA Automated Reasoning Group, and you'll find a bunch of um, tools there and otherwise. Uh, thank you.